This little lecture is about community structure. We can define a community local, locally or regionally. A local example would be one stratum like life form group of plants in a very local area. For example, herbaceous plants of the pine rocklands or if we want to look at animals, all of the herbivorous fish in a given river system, or perhaps a widespread regional vegetation type, like pine savanna, this would be the bigger picture, or for the animal example, all of the aquatic animals in tropical freshwater habitats. In the realm of plant ecology, we can talk about an association, which is a community that's been described in several different locations. And that community usually has consistent composition, more or less the same species present. It looks the same. It has a uniform physiognomy, that is. And it has a distribution characteristic of a particular habitat, particular kind of substrate, temperature, rainfall, etc. But an association is kind of an ideal. It's a synthesis of many local examples of vegetation, and those local examples we can call stands. So a community is a group of populations that coexist in the very same habitat in one particular place. An association is a particular type of community a synthesis made from many different examples in different places that has consistent floristic composition, uniform physiognomy, that looks the same, that is, and a distribution characteristic of a particular habitat. And again, a stand is a single example of a community. The fact that we can find plant communities that have consistent floristic composition is evidence of strong interactions between the species found there, some biologists think, and this is called the discrete view of community structure. People that hold this view um, agree that communities are integrated units and the whole of the community is greater than simply the sum of the parts the species occurring together. And probably the most well-known proponent of this idea was Frederick Clements, operating in the early part of the 20th century, who thought of the community like an organism. And he equated associations, that is, species frequently found together, with organisms. So in this little picture with the um, habitat continuum along the bottom, on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, how important the different species are. Each of these bumps on this continuum is a given species, and an association would appear where all of these species coexist, and then we call these nodes. So in this view, communities were set or closed. A more modern view, at least at the beginning of the 20th century, was the continuum view. And Henry Gleason published a book that um, heralded the individualistic concept of the plant association, saying that communities were different almost everywhere they existed because of the different coincidences of plant species according to other, you know, to whatever requirements of the habitat affected their distribution. And he found, looking at floras from different places, that there were differences in vegetation from one site to another, so maybe an association wasn't quite the right way to look at things. And that communities, in his opinion, weren't determined by a grand plan, but by dispersal of that each species in question, the environment they required, and so each community was a fortuitous or random assemblage. And this Gleason view was supported by the fact that species change their abundance and presence 
gradually over the landscape and individually. So he felt that communities are not larger than the sum of their parts and that levels of interactions and interdependence of the plant species with each other was low or at least relatively nonspecific. And here's the same kind of diagram showing that individualistic concept of the plant association, that of open communities, where each species has a different distribution along an environmental gradient, and there's no such thing as nodes, but wherever you happen to be samples that um, assemblage of species at that point in the landscape. But many ecologists recognize that there are emergent characteristics, which are those features of a community that can't be predicted or estimated from what species occur there, such as what it looks like, the shape of the forest, the um, frequencies or proportions of the different life forms of plants, how much they cover, the leaf area index, their phenology. The next is species composition, which species are actually there. The patterns of the species depend on what other species are there. And properties of the community diversity, which we'll look at a little more later, species richness, species evenness, and diversity within a stand and between stands. Nutrient cycling, how long nutrients remain in the system, if they're stored or not, and how much nutrients are required by the plant's species present, how things change over time, we'll look at that, succession and evolution, and productivity, how much biomass is present, how much new biomass is produced. Let's take a little closer look at the organismic view of Clements and others who saw see the community as an integrated unit. As I mentioned, Clements equated associations with organisms. And Thomas Lovelock, in his Gaia hypothesis, um, scaled this up a bit to look at the Earth as a living organism. Jared Diamond made assembly rules. Well, he looked at communities as they were and made some generalizations of distributions of individual sizes and proportions of species of different sizes. And Dick Root came up with the concept of guilds. I like this term a lot because members of a guild don't have to be taxonomically related at all. They are groups of species that occupy the same ecological position. For example, eating the same kind of thing or living in the same kind of way. So the modern synthesis of plant ecology uses both these cl the classical approaches with some new ideas. Dave Tillman pointed out the importance of competition among species in shaping what the whole community looks like. Stuart Pickett and Associates pointed out to us the role of disturbance in maintaining diversity. And the British plant population ecologists John Harper and Jonathan Silvertown demonstrated that the dynamics of populations may make things change over time, but also keep things diverse. Phil Regal showed or um, hypothesized that increasing um, plant-animal interactions led to changes in vegetation over the surface of the earth over time, helping angiosperms attain their dominance over gymnosperms and so on. And then a number of ecologists, including Mary Power, showed, demonstrated the role of keystone species in maintaining diversity. So I want to spend a little time talking about the different attributes of plant communities that can be studied. Let's look first at physiognomy, or what they look like, and these are the four things we're going to look at. Plant architecture was first described 
by making profile diagrams of forests. And sometimes these were made when forests were cut down. People would measure the trees and reconstruct these things. Um, envisioning different strata from the top to the bottom. The A layer are trees that poke up above the canopy. They are emergence. B, canopy trees. C, the subcanopy trees. D would be the shrub layer. And E, the ground layer of herbs and tree seedlings. So here's an architectural profile diagram from Tropical Rainforest in Trinidad, not that different from here in South Florida, hardwood forests, with the tallest trees, the A or B layer, not no emergence here, at 35 to 40 meters in height, the subcanopy layer, 25 to 20 meters in height, then the shrub layer, the herb layer isn't shown here. And here's a profile diagram by the plant ecologist Pierre Dansero. I like this very much because it shows the different kind of leaves the trees may have, not necessarily even species by species, but broad leaves, simple leaves, compound leaves, and the needle-like leaves of gymnosperms. You can also see the feature that in many temperate forests, there's a big gap between the canopy, subcanopy, and the lower part of the forest. Tropical forests are different than this. Another way of comparing physiognomy, or what a community looks like, is to measure the leaf area index, which we can define as the total leaf area, measured as the upper surface of the leaves usually, divided by the ground area. So comparing a simple cornfield, where you might have six or seven leaves above a unit of ground at the most. Think of a dense forest with canopy trees, many layers of leaves, compared with a pine forest or conifer forest with much smaller needle-like leaves. Then there's phenology, which means the timing of events. And when plants are concerned, we can measure leafing phenology, flowering, fruiting, fruit maturation, etc. And the best way to study this is to mark individuals with tags and revisit them weekly or monthly to quantify these things over a number of individuals in the population. And people have done studies like this in different parts of the world and found that many um, things, including leafing and flowering, correspond with rainfall patterns in tropical places and temperature in some other places. And things aren't always completed within a year. In fact, for a number of tropical trees, it's been found that individuals may flower only every three, four, or five years. So these are superannual patterns. So to finish up this lecture, let I want you to think about any species you like. It could be a plant or an animal and describe what might be differences in phenology that that organism might display in different geographic locations that might distinguish these different communities.